challenges is that there are these two disciplines, broadly construed as the humanities and the sciences, and engineering probably falls somewhere around in the science area. I love the girl on the trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> humanities, science, engineering, <laughs> As you see here, I'm a part of this uh, fellowship It's um, through the Christian College um, organization. And it's ho hosted in Oxford, funded in part by the Templeton and the Blankenmeyer Foundation. Uh, this has helped create here the foundation of a technology and theology club, where we think about what a good life is by thinking about what life's for and what it's about. And by doing so, recognizing, hey, we live in a life that's technological in almost every single way. Uh, and this lecture will hope to point some of that out to you. What I've been doing, what I did last summer, and what I get to do this summer, is I get to go spend a month in Oxford with 24 other professors from around the globe, really. Most of them are scientists. Zero engineers. Two theologians. So there's only me and one other person. Three philosophers, everyone else is um, a scientist or in psychology, some kind of science, science of psychology ties this thing. And so every one of us has a particular research question that we are pursuing. Um, actually, not as much as I thought I would, mainly, OK, so I'll do a true confession here. It's videotaped, because all the true confessions are uh, I mainly did it because I said, hey, Amy, my wife, do you want to go to Oxford <laughs> for two summers? You know, we were in the UK for a couple of years before Longview. And she's like, yeah, okay, that'll be a holiday. And I was like, it will be a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's great because, you know, basically nerd camp. Uh, I went to lectures from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. with dinners afterwards so that we could talk about them, Monday through Friday. I took a field trip to Cambridge to look at uh, rare books, 
So here's Newton's uh, Principia, the very first edition, which you can actually touch because the letters from your skin are good for preserving the pages. So we did all of these sorts of things. We listened to lectures from preeminent uh, scholars, most of them um, historians, philosophers, and scientists themselves. And so we're doing something like that again this summer. Um, let's get this. Oops. Uh, I'm missing my slide. But that's okay. All right. So the lecture I want to give to you today, which really is going to pose a lot of questions. I'm going to move really quickly. I actually feel like I'm not being a good academic and theologian here by running so fast over some of these details. Uh, so... That's okay, it's for a greater cause, and that is to generate some questions and discussion. Here's my simple argument that I'm going to be making. Technology and science are bound together. Science is a profoundly technological enterprise, but perhaps not in the way we're imagining. So I will get into describing this situation in a moment. But the reason that we need to think about science and technology together is because I think really the question that we should all be thinking about is what a human person is. And we'll see in a moment what really drives the modern period is not a new scientific theory or a new way about knowledge, but a new understanding of what the human person is. And it's developed alongside a new method in science powers discovered through harnessing technology. So here is C.P. Snow, who a, was a physicist and also a novelist, professor at Cambridge. He gave a lecture in 1959. And in this lecture, this is a famous lecture, curious, how many folks have heard of the two cultures lecture? The book. Yeah, the, it's now, you can read it as a book. Uh, and what it, he's basically saying is there are two cultures, humanities and science. And the reason he, he sort of starts autobiographically, he goes, listen, I'm a scientist. All day I'm in the lab. And then I'll go out quite literally and hang out with my colleagues who are from philosophy or other departments in the humanities. And it's like two different worlds. <laughs> And I ask them about physics, and they're like, what? I don't know. Which, he says, that would be like if they asked me about reading any Shakespeare. And I was like, what? I don't know. What's that? There's a sense in which there's an educational formation going on in two directions. And this is the great challenge. It's not simply that we have two different ways of doing Understanding the world, but we have two different cultures. We have two different educational tracks that divide us. We'll never figure things out unless we can get to the basic problem, which is education. Here we are at a university. That's fitting. Neil Postman is a, a theorist of sorts who's written about technology. Okay, he's pretty famous for coining the term technopoly. Uh, he says, you know what? That lecture isn't true anymore. There's not two cultures in the way that he thinks. There's two cultures. There's technology and there's everybody else. <laughs> okay? So here's what he writes. First, technology is a friend. It makes life easier, cleaner, and longer. Can anyone ask more of a friend? Second, because of its lengthy, intimate, and inevitable relationship with culture, Technology does not invite a close examination of its own consequences. It's the kind of friend that asks for trust and obedience, which most people are inclined to give because of the gift, because its gifts are truly bountiful. But of course, there is a dark side to this friend. Its gifts are not without heavy costs. I saw the guy like <laughs> picture over it. 
Cutting edge at the polytechnic. <laughs> but of course there's a dark side to this friend. Its gifts are not without a heavy cost. Stated in the most dramatic terms, the accusation can be made that the uncontrolled growth of technology destroys the vital sources of our humanity. It creates a culture without moral foundation. It undermines certain mental processes and social relationships that make human life worth living. Technology, in sum, is both friend and enemy. I'm going to argue, uh, I'm going to help us see why he's making this claim, but I'm also going to argue that really what is at the heart of this understanding is theology. Underneath the scientific technological enterprise is a theology. And it's a bad one. It's a bad story. It's the story of creation and fall. Not quite redemption, but creation and fall. Now this is not only, what I, the claim I'm making is not simply, yeah, there's this general myth that everyone gets because we're in a Western society where there's, there was once a beautiful time, a beautiful state, paradise, and we've lost it, and humanity is forever trying to get back to that. Plenty of commentators have noted that this is a basic myth, a basic pattern of thought, that's what I mean. I'm making a, a claim that's even stronger. When you read the very first uh, philosophers of nature who paved the way for science and technology to come together and form the modern disciplines of science that we have, they are referencing this story directly. They are Christians working with this story. And I don't have time to trace all of this out, but I'm going to look at just Francis Bacon. So there's a book, if you're interested, by Peter Harrison that uh, is devoted to tracing all of the ways that the fall language, the narrative of creation and fall, is being resourced as folks are describing. This is what science is for, and this is what it does. And this is why technology should be a part of it. So there is, in other words, a goal to science and technology that looks quite Christian. But there's something really wrong with it that's not so obvious which means it's at odds with a very, very core conviction at the heart of the Christian tradition. So I said we'd look at Francis Bacon, and the reason we're going to look at Francis Bacon is he is often thought of as the person who ties, who gives the new method to science that pushes it forward, the Baconian method. And he was also the first one to unite the mechanical arts, which were largely disparaged at this time, and say, no, look, there's, there's something great about this. We need to bring this together with this new method that I'm talking about. So, Bacon, here's, uh, here's one of his ways that he describes what's going on. For, for man, by the fall, fell at the same time from his state of innocency, uh, uh, in an innocency and from his from his dominion over creation. Both of these losses, however, can even in this life be in some part repaired. The former by religion and faith, the latter by arts and sciences. Now notice what Bacon is saying here. He's linking his project explicitly to the way he thinks the world is. It's a theological claim. This is the way the world is. Now, something we also need to understand of God creating the world. The goal is for humanity to have a good life, but fall, the fall jeopardizes that, doesn't it? Now creation is in rebellion. Human beings are in rebellion. And so human beings are vulnerable 
human beings are in threat by their threatened by their environment. And so Bacon praises what was discouraged, mechanical arts, for this reason. The other things, philosophy, theology, history, he goes, they don't do anything to relieve the suffering of the human condition. And therefore, thoughts. That's not useful. This new scientific method that's being developed, however, is useful because it aims at this end. And this is why Bacon claims that knowledge is power. Anyone ever heard this quotation? Knowledge is power. Maybe you thought it came from G.I. Joe. Um, <laughs> now you know. Knowing's half the battle. Um, talk about this and I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so <laughs> more slide than this. That's just a teaser. <laughs> just a teaser. So, why is knowledge power? Knowledge is power because if we can understand something, if we can break it down to its constituent parts, like taking apart a machine, then we can control it. If we can understand it, we can control it. <coughs> Now I've just realized I opened the wrong version of this, and that's why I don't have the quotation I'm looking for. Um, technology failed. <laughs> technology failed. That's meta. So Bacon has this great quotation about why knowledge is power. Knowledge requires that we understand what is happening inside of nature. And when we do that, we can control it. If we don't understand it, we can't control it. We have no power without understanding. True knowledge is power, and the goal of knowledge is power. What's wrong with philosophy, history, and theology is they don't give us power. They don't give us power over nature. Now this method has been so influential, it's here at our university, positioning inductive reasoning and the attention to causality at the, science, at the center of what we do in the sciences. So we take life apart, we dissect it, we separate it into discrete parts. Labs all over the world do this. Labs on this university do this by contributing to the questions of knowledge. The hope is that we can have knowledge that is useful for controlling our surroundings so that we can eliminate, eliminate misery and expand the power we have over our surroundings. An unintentional consequence of this was that nature, which has a kind of order to it, becomes seen as raw material, or maybe just parts. It's very fascinating. Folks have studied the way that mechanical language has shaped how humans have understood the world. And of course, we've seen how some of this language was all metaphorical, by the way. It's been challenged by later developments in physics as well. So a key part of this story is creation and fall. Now, the Royal Academy of Science loves Bacon, and they want, they, this is a way an institution is set up to take this new method and this new partner between science and technology together to form scientists and people skilled in mechanical arts, okay? But what quickly happens is, um, People no longer really want to think about creation of false stuff as too theological. And yet, the orientation has already been set. So that means that at the heart is this unquestioned desire to control for a good cause, eliminate suffering. Who can be against that? Now, you might think that um, this isn't really the case. You might wonder, well, show me where you can, where I can see that. Uh, the problem is, I've got the wrong slides up, so I can't show it to you, which is a bummer. I have it. I can do it the old way. I can do it the old way. Okay, I can do it here.
There it is. All right. Hopefully, volume's here. Is there another volume? volume I'm volume. hitting it here. All there somewhere. Big volume. Main volume. I don't hear anything, do you? Well, I paused it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not loud enough, but. We're putting AI into everything, and everything into the cloud. It's all so smart, but how do you work with it? Ask this farmer. He's using satellite data to help increase crop yields. That's smart for the food we eat. At this port, supply chains are becoming more transparent with blockchain. That's smart for millions of shipments. In this lab, researchers are working with Watson to help them find new treatments. That's smart for medicine. At this bank, the world's most encrypted mainframe is helping prevent cybercrime. That's smart for everyone. And in Africa, IoT sensors and the IBM cloud are protecting endangered animals. That's smart for rhinos. Yeah, rhinos. Because smart only really matters when we put it to work. Not just for a few of us, but for all of us. Let's put smart to work. Knowledge is power. Let's put smart to work. Even for rhinos. Yes, rhinos. We'll save that for later. Now it's in this view. I don't know how to switch it from this one because I've never been. I don't think I'm in the freezer. I always have one. So notice what was happening in this. It's a it's a utopian story. Oh no. We are going to make the world a paradise. We're going to make this world much better by making a smarter world. Uh, it's a world in which there's less suffering and there's more choice. There's more freedom. There's less dependence on the natural. However, mm. if you notice the stuff about blockchain... I don't know. We'll leave it there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you notice the stuff about blockchain? Now it's because, well, there's like this kind of independence we need from technology. Well, wait a second. We're in the vortex now of de devising technology to make us independent from other forms of technology. We have to protect ourselves from technology to make it safe. Notice also that this is a world in which it is much, much more difficult to see where technology begins and technology ends. Where is the clear line between the natural and the artificial? They're blurred, they're overlapping, they're interpenetrating, they are fused. And notice what we're dealing with at the end. How really do you think this world is made better? Okay, it's smarter. What do they mean by smarter? This is a real question this time. What, is, what do they mean by smarter? Information at our fingertips. Okay. Okay. Information at our fingertips, yeah. So, like, easier to get information. Quicker. Okay. Why is integration good? Because... Say you, if you look at car engines, they went from being carburetor powered to fuel injection. With that comes an increased level of precision and efficiency. Okay. And that applies to other things as well. Okay. And you want more? You want information quicker because it's more efficient. And you said efficiency. Okay. Yeah, Keep alert. More perfect. <laughs> more okay. perfect. What's more perfect? So there's less of a chance. For yeah. Less mistakes? Like more efficient? Yeah. Oh. Okay. That's three. Any, who, what else does it mean to be smarter? Easier. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> okay. This is the key. Efficiency. Efficiency is a category that we need to think about. Uh, the reason efficiency is such a big deal 
is because only technology, because technology does this in a very particular way, okay? Albert Borgman has made a distinction. One way to help us think about technology is to focus on this relationship between means and ends, okay? And he says, you know what it is about technology that's so modern technology, by the way, uh, what he calls the device paradigm. So not like art and hose, but cell phones, these sorts of things. Actually, watches is a good example. Technology is magic. It's magic. C.S. Lewis also calls it magic. Do you know why? Why is it magic? Because where else can you create something out of not the parts that need to be there for it? Okay, stay with me for a second. I'll come back to that. The end, the goal of this whatever you want to accomplish can be accomplished without the means. The end, the goal is now separable from the means that make up the very thing you're after. So stay with me. And I had a slide to help you through this, but there used to be a way of thinking about the relationship between means and ends that was more stable. So you've got something where you've got to build a house, right? So you need material, otherwise you can't get to the house, right? That's pretty simple. <laughs> I'm lecture, I know. You need like the form of a house, like you just can't throw the stuff. And this is what I tried to do when I was remodeling the kitchen. You just can't like throw the stuff together. You need more than just the materials, you need the form. That's another kind of cause, that's another means. And then you need like someone throwing the stuff together. Well, ideally you need someone hammering it together. You need an efficient cause. But then Aristotle would say, it's not really a home until what? Let's say you put it all together. It's not a home until it's lived in. Until it's lived in. That's the goal. Now a house isn't magic because you can't separate all the different parts from it to get the goal. However, your watch, your modern watch, is magic in this way. It doesn't matter what is going on inside of there. At one point, there was little gears. Now there are circuits. The entire construction of it has been changed. Well, we don't see it, it's invisible, it's on the inside. So you can change it, and you can get there. Okay, and you're thinking, yeah, but it works. It does work. And that's fine. But we'll see what the problem is here in a moment. <coughs> so in technology, the machinery can be radically changed without threat to the identity or the familiarity of the function of the device. So no one's confused when one is invited to replace one's watch powered by a spring, regulated by a balance wheel, displaying time with a dial and pointers with a watch that is powered electrically, or a smart watch. No one notices, really, what's going on on the inside. The end is stable, but the means can be interchanged. This is what's magic about technology. And it is truly remarkable. And it is amazing power. There's something called the Baconian Project, which picks up on this. This is a term coined by uh, Jerry McKinney, and but he's not alone. Everyone agrees. Philosophy, everyone's pointing to Bacon and saying, hey, this is a thing. Uh, so the Baconian project, remember, it's not like this. I don't, is this anyone's roommate, by the way? <laughs> I feel like I've maybe seen this Percy saga. Um, okay. Oh, there's my, there's my slide. Oh, I just got out of order. All right. So... Look how Bacon starts to get to how we can change kind of what's going on on the inside. Because we're doing it with nature.
nature in the first place. Human knowledge and human power meet in one. For where the cause is not known, the effect cannot be produced. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. And that which is contemplation as, uh, is as the cause and its operation as the rule. In other words, we need to understand, just like your watch, how all the little parts inside can make it tick, we need to understand this with nature. We need to understand this across the board. And the problem is that this has been applied to, to human beings as well. It's not as crude as substituting the organs and parts of a human being for different parts, though we can do that part of, uh, to a certain extent. What's happening here is that technology is shaping us in a powerful way by experiencing the magic of ends and means being separated. So, let me give you what I think is one clear example of how this, through technology, and here's one of my points, technology really thinks that helps us think about being human, more than theology does, which is sad. But technology helps, makes me think about who I am as a, you know, I'm a theologian doing this stuff, but then technology is also, I'm always feeling the kind of disconnect between these two ways of thinking. Now that I have some eyes to see. One clear example that technology is the greatest influence on our thinking, feeling, and living. The radical shift in our views on sexuality that have occurred in the last five to ten years. This is a change that's impossible without technologies of gender reassignment surgery, surrogacy, artificial reproduction, the promise of synthetic gametes, which enable us to reimagine all of these, a completely new biology, a completely new person. Without these technologies, it would simply be impossible to imagine that a biological man might really become a woman, or vice versa. Thanks to technologies of surrogacy and artificial reproduction, it's possible for same-sex marriage to look just like the traditional family with biological offspring, in part. Synthetic gametes will hopefully, the hope is that now two folks of the same sex will have offspring related to both because you no longer need a sperm or egg cell to work with. You can just use skin cells. That's the hope. This is an extreme example, isn't it? It's an extreme example on the edge of our technological culture, but I think it reveals what's going on at the center. Ends and means are separated. Human nature can be separated from, it, from certain goals. So the goal of having children can substitute the participants. You can actually even substitute the act of intercourse. Substitution, means and ends are being separated. In a sense, all of the, the kinds of ethical problems that we wrestle with, they don't, they're given to us by technology. Technology runs ahead and then we start to think, well what? I mean even something like when does life begin? That only happens after we can see what's going on in the southern level. But not just that, manipulate it. Same with the end. When is, what is death? That used to be pretty self-evident when someone was dead. Now it's not so clear. That means when we're thinking of defining life and death, we're doing it after the reality created by scientific and technological knowledge and power. That's really profound. I don't think it's self-evident, and a lot of times people think technology is changing us by you know, the amount of Netflix we consume, or what the content is coming in through Netflix, 
but I would argue that it's actually the power of technology that we take for granted to separate means and ends. So let me shift to a proper creation and fall narrative. Because any critique of what's going on in our world today with scientific and technological developments must grapple with the deeper question of what a human being is. So the creation fall narrative, oh I did have that slide. The creation fall narrative, if you notice in Bacon's uh, story, there's no real clear distinction between fallenness and creatureliness. Well, how do you know that that limit is because of sin rather than the way God made things? We've had a difficulty in reading this story and recognizing how central to this story dependence on God and on human beings and on the creation is for human life. So first of all, that God creates out of nothing means that every single thing has its dependence outside of itself on God. There are no self-grounding things in the world. It also means that the way that God ordered the world is good. And it's good in its <coughs> dependence on God. When's the first time we get a sense that creation isn't good in Genesis? God saw the man by himself. Exactly. It's not good that this human being is living an independent life. This human being must live in an interdependent relationship. It's not good to do otherwise. How much of our life is about being independent of interdependence? And there's certainly disabling dependence and people exploiting weakness and vulnerability. That would be sin. But there's a creatureliness of interdependence and dependence that God simply says, without which my creation is not good. Just, just talked about this in my class today. Human beings, are they immortal in the garden? It's a tricky question. What do you mean by immortal? Human beings, if they didn't eat the food that God gave them, would die. Wait, what? Human beings are dependent on creation for nourishment, for sustaining life. That's not a result of the fall. Could, could Adam have gone on a hunger strike and starved to death? Here, that's a crazy question. You know what else is it? The whole story of Genesis 2 and 3 is crazy because why in the world, how could Adam and Eve sin? How could they give up being made dependent on God? And what does the serpent promise them will, will happen if they eat of this fruit? They'll be like God. Irony of ironies, God made them in his image. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? It means to be for God and for creatures. That's who God is. Human beings who reject these limits, and there's all these different limits. If you look, if you if you look at the chain that leads to the fall, you're like, well. Eve was sort of part of this story. That was a limit we couldn't have done without. How about the tree you're not supposed to eat from in the first place? Why would God put this thing there? And then it like will mess it all up. I mean, if God didn't put that tree there, they'd be fine. God gave them this temptation. No, God did not give them a temptation by giving them a limit. What he said, he gave them even more freedom through the grace of limit. Just as Adam was further limited by the existence of Eve. This interdependence 
this boundary creating is the very essence of creaturely life. And when we think about what it's all for, what is this world ordered for? Rest with God. Through interdependence from God, human beings, and creation. And you can't get that without separating the needs on that end. Technology has a way of eliminating creaturely limits. And some of these things are good. Right? So I'm not saying it's all bad. But it's very difficult to tell, actually, when it is bad. That's more of my point. It's really hard for us to think about when erasing limits are a bad thing. I, in fact, I think the, Christ, the challenge of the church today is to be able to articulate limits. Why do Christians say no to certain things? Why do Christians say no to certain ways of life? Why do Christians use their time in this manner? Why do Christians insist upon embodiment in the ways that they do. On location in the ways that they do. Time, space, and bodies are the things that technology helps human beings transcend. Yes, yes, okay, so there's some limits in the garden, but we all know that in the future there won't be. Jesus comes back after the crucifixion and resurrection. And remember when he meets with the disciples on the road to Emmaus? He unpacks the scriptures for them and tells them how it's really all about him. And here's what the, say, the mission given to Abraham now looks like in light of what he's accomplished. And his disciples say, Ah, oh, remember when Jesus was with us and our hearts burned? Nope. Remember when that guy was with us? When do they recognize who Jesus is? When he breaks bread. There's also echoes of the formula for the way that communion or Eucharist would be celebrated. Uh, we find in the New Testament here. God of Jesus taking, giving thanks, breaking, and giving they don't recognize Jesus until they eat with him. Isaiah 25 is a picture of the end, and it's a banquet feast. The marriage supper of the Lamb. A really important miracle to kick off all miracles in John chapter 2 is a wedding feast. Incidentally, both in Isaiah and in John, people are eating or drinking wine, so you know it's a party banquet feast, right? Elements of creation are there. Jesus isn't just putting on a show. Although he can disappear, whatever that's about, he also eats food, and it doesn't just like drop right through him. They think he's a ghost, but they don't recognize him, and he says, I'm not a ghost, let's eat some food. That's like, I guess, the ultimate test. That's the biblical test for whether someone's a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a... This is what the resurrection affirms, that human bodily existence is good. And actually, the real question is, how will this bodily existence live in the new life like Jesus? And in 1 Corinthians 15, we get a distinction between a natural body and a spiritual body. And you're thinking, ah, oh, the spiritual body, that's not a body, it's spiritual. The Greek is pneumaticon soma, which is a spirit-powered body versus a natural body. It's two bodies. One is powered by the suki, or the natural, kind of like psychological. The natural, that body will die. Genesis 2, Adam is created from the 
dirt. Dust in the Old Testament symbolizes temporality, frailty, located temporal existence. And the, lo the life is not complete. Adam is not a living being until God breathes spirit. So you've got a spirit powered dust ball, and that's Adam. <laughs> When Paul unpacks how it is that people will be raised, he says, look, Genesis 2-7, they will be a body that is once again powered by the Spirit of God and like Christ, therefore imperishable. They're raised in Christ, it is through Christ's body that they regain their embodied existence. Now C.S. Lewis has fun with one way to draw these different threads together. He says, you know, at the great final banquet, we're all going to be there. And we'll be, the food will be set. All the drinks are there. We're ready. None of us have elbows, though. Elbows are a, are a result of the fall. Adam and Eve didn't have elbows. So here we will be, ready to eat. It won't work. We'll have to feed each other. We'll have greater interdependence on one another and on God than we had in the garden. The movement isn't away from creatureliness, but deeper into it. And actually, the way that the Genesis 1 through 3 unfolds is God keeps deepening creaturely dependence by putting more things there. Remarkable. This means that while the, the true telos, science and technology, is to eliminate human suffering, it means we really need to think about what's necess those necessary conditions for a good life. Otherwise, we'll start <coughs> eliminating the very limits or boundaries or things that look like weakness that are necessary for a good life. Based on this story, we should start fusing elbows together. Right now. That will lead to a better life. <laughs> All right? We're laughing because we know that's not possible in this world. But the promise is that one day there will be such peace and harmony and such creaturely goodness through our dependence on one another that will prefer that we will rejoice with the way that God has made the world. Now, I'm not, I don't know, I could, I could be accused of being a little harsh on science or technology here, but my point is really, one take, my takeaway for y'all, because you're the people in this discipline, or in these disciplines, is that how to think about this stuff comes from, come from you. But it won't come from you unless you also do some reading, thinking, discussing in the discipline of history, philosophy, theology, and literature. But I have no, I'm not in, I'm not truly trained in these fields. So what I say doesn't really matter what y'all say that matters and that there are real possible helpful solutions that come from within your disciplines that aren't possible from within mine. This is one way that C.S. Lewis defends himself when he takes on um, kind of this scientific, techno-scientific culture in an essay called The Abolition of Man. He was just saying that we're destroying humans by our domination human nature. We're losing nature. And he says, look, the reason I'm saying all this is because we need scientists to help us think through this. So solutions are possible from that side of the table. So let me really conclude with just a call um, for 
for y'all to take advantage of your time at Victoria University because there's not much time to think once you leave this place. This is a gift to have the space and time in the community to be in a community of learning, of discourse, of worship, of friendship, of interdependence on one another that is really just that. This last one right here doesn't mean that these are the best years of your life. That's not what I'm saying. But this is a unique opportunity to take advantage of. But your time is limited. Our people will be here and we'll be in the Joyce room for lunch if you want to join us. Thank our speaker again.